1969, saw the beginning of an uprising which changed the course of history. Casting out the police and fiercely resisting military troops, the workers, students, and masses of the city of Córdoba in Argentina tore down the facade of stable capitalist governance. The uprising provided a political foundation for the emergence of new currents of trade union activism and of armed revolutionary organizations. The military government against which it was directed was obliged to retreat, a retreat which ultimately led to a new period of intense class struggle and a significant political opening. For workers, students, and the left, it provides a tremendous example and is one of the most important left experiences of the 1960s. We will be reconstructing the political and social background, talk about the key actors, provide an overview of the events, and discuss what lessons can be drawn from this incredible and understudied historical experience. In 1969, Argentina was under the thumb of a military dictatorship. This dictatorship was the latest attempt by the Argentinian ruling class to resolve the crisis of governability, a crisis which began with the right-wing-led overthrow of Perón's left nationalist government in 1955. Both the Peronist and far-left parties were politically prohibited and repressed. A secession of military and civilian governments ruled Argentina while workers' share of the economy in terms of wages fell drastically. The latest government came to power replacing the elected civilian government in 1966 in the so-called Argentinian Revolution, a military coup about as far from a revolution as you can get. This military government declared its intention to bring about a 20-year-long period of military rule and immediately set about enacting orthodox pro-Washington economic policies designed to attract foreign investment and keep wages low. While many middle-class and professional sectors initially welcomed the military government as a hoped-for solution to the crisis of governability, this content quickly grew in response to military policies. The university system was overhauled and effectively purged. Censorship, restrictions on free speech, and even a crackdown on cultural and nightlife activities all contributed to the radicalization of middle-class sectors. This process accelerated the emergence of a new left both on university campuses and within workplaces. The Cuban Revolution, Che Guevara's execution in Bolivia, and the ongoing example of Vietnam helped spark the radicalization of a new generation among both the Marxist and nationalist left. Militants from the pseudo-Trotskyist PRT and dissidents from the official Communist Party had begun the patient work of elaborating and advocating for armed resistance to the dictatorship. An initial attempt at a rural guerrilla insurrection was attempted by a left-wing Peronist group, but was quickly smashed by the military. Groups inspired by the liberation theology of dissident Catholic priests like Camilo Torres were creating the foundations for what would later emerge as the Montaneros, a guerrilla group which linked itself to the bourgeois nationalism of Peron. Throughout the country, armed resistance to the dictatorship and a path toward socialism were being discussed and debated. Yet as a whole, there was no successful action to point towards. The left was still comparatively small, and even the most committed Guevarists understood that Argentina was a lot different from Cuba. What could or should the practice of armed resistance or an overthrow of the dictatorship look like in a country like Argentina? Córdoba, in May of 1969, would provide a tremendous example here, though as with all great historical events, different sectors of the left would go on to interpret it in very different ways. Córdoba is a major city in the north of Argentina, which experienced rapid growth over the course of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It experienced a limited form of industrialization, one which significantly altered the city's economic and social structure, but which was structured entirely around a few key industries. The most important was the automotive industry, which was dominated by just two major companies, Renault and Fiat. Both foreign companies, which didn't have their Argentine headquarters in Córdoba, uh, opting instead for the capital of Argentina, Buenos Aires, as their corporate HQs. While Córdoba had an industrial proletariat, in many ways it lacked an industrial bourgeoisie. 
the major company headquarters, the banks, commercial industry, all of that was based centrally in Buenos Aires. What remained in Cordoba for these businesses was a small class of functionaries and local management. Cordoba as a city found itself in a twofold relationship of dependency. As a part of Argentina, it suffered from the broader relationship of dependency confronting the country. Within Argentina, it was itself in a relationship of dependency to the metropolitan capital of Buenos Aires. Yet precisely what it lacked because of this, an industrial bourgeoisie and a lengthy tradition of union bureaucracy, those were the elements that would help to put it in the vanguard of the revolutionary struggle in Latin America. The key to unlocking this political potential was a student worker alliance which brought together class struggle unionism with the radicalizing youth. De siempre en Barrio Clínica, los estudiantes se suben a las azoteas de todos los domicilios de aquí, por eso es tan difícil tomar el Barrio Clínica cuando es ocupado. Llueven piedras desde los techos, pero son de pequeño tamaño. La policía se retira después. El policía que encabezaba el pelotón conversa con los estudiantes. Los estudiantes dan gritos a la policía para que se detenga, avisándole de que hay otro policía aquí. La policía de Córdoba estrena sus nuevos escudos mientras llueven botellas de los techos. Escuchan disparos de gases lacrimógenos. Los estudiantes lanzan botellas y bombas molotov y la policía contesta con disparos de bombas de gases lacrimógenos. Cordoba has a long history of student resistance, reaching back to when it was the launching point for a nationwide student movement in 1918. This movement fought for university autonomy and democratic governance of the universities, which at the time were tightly controlled by state and local elites. It saw a series of intense student strikes and a political battle with the university authorities, one which spread out to universities across Argentina. It also explicitly marked out lines of sympathy and solidarity with the working class. Important concessions were won, but the fortunes of the university more generally tended to wax and wane with the different political regimes in Argentina. The generation of students in Córdoba in the 1960s was very different from that of the 1910s, but the legacy of student activism had continued. The military dictatorship of Ongania cracked down drastically on university freedoms. The new generation of radicalizing students were also no longer happy to stop with the struggle for a free university. Many inspired by the Cuban Revolution and anti-colonial struggles, they made their aim the transformation of the university into a tool of political and social liberation. While in the 1960s the majority of students continued to come from upper or middle class backgrounds, a new, vitally important category appeared as a product both of the deterioration of conditions for the middle class and of the limited entry of popular sectors into the universities. 35% of students were now student workers. The student movement and its alliance with the workers movement would come to be symbolized by the martyrdom of one student worker in particular, Santiago Pampijon. In July 1966, one month after the military coup, the government intervened in the universities in what was known as the Night of the Long Canes. Students resisted, and a series of student strikes in Córdoba culminated in an attempted assembly on September 7th. The police moved in to repress the assembly and opened fire on the students. Santiago Pampijon, a student activist and a worker in the Renault auto factory, was shot three times and after six agonizing days in the hospital, died. The main union, the CGT, called for a protest march which was then also repressed. The student movement was forced to operate clandestinely in the aftermath and used the union halls of the CGT for many of its meetings. Pampijon became a symbol for the student movement 
and his death was a catalyst for a deepening solidarity as well as practical organizational links between the student and worker struggles in Cordoba. The result was that Cordoba counted with a significant student sector which already had experience in street skirmishes and which was closely tied to the working class both politically and in its own composition, a strong foundation which was spurred on by a growing wave of student protest. The composition of Cordoba's working class was heavily concentrated in the automotive industry, and in particular in the plants of Renault and Fiat. The traditional strategic importance of the automotive sector was in effect multiplied in Cordoba, where there were few other major industries. Beyond this, there were important unions in construction, among metal workers, and in transport. A small but very strategic sector which played a key leadership role were the state electrical workers. Cordoba's distance from Buenos Aires also meant that it was more difficult to keep closely under the control of the traditional union bureaucracy. An exceptional level of autonomy was possible, which allowed for the unions to take more militant positions. The major union federation in Argentina, the CGT, had split in two separate unions in 1968. A group of more independent unionists tied to the left wing of the Peronist movement won control of the CGT's Congress. The old guard of the bureaucracy tied to a more collaborationist approach to with the dictatorship refused to accept the results and withdrew from the Congress beforehand. The traditional CGT and the new CGTA which wanted to adopt a more militant approach against the dictatorship, both competed for influence in and control of the workers' movement. Elpidio Torres was the head of SMATA, the main union representing auto workers, and built his union machine largely on the model set by the conservative old CGT. Backdoor negotiations, targeted firings, and the occasional mafia-like intimidation or disappearance. By 1969, however, some cracks were appearing, and some left groups had even built small opposition caucuses. Rank-and-file pressure was growing, and the old model was not so successful at containing this. Torres had to be ready to adapt to not get ousted by more militant forces. The militant leader of the Electrical Workers' Union, Lucy Fuerza, Light and Power, was Agustin Tosco. Tosco played a central role in the CGTA and the broader Argentine working class. While the electrical workers were a comparatively well-paid and more privileged section of the working class, this corresponded to their tremendous potential power in the economy, a power which a conscious and militant leadership was able to direct towards the broader aim of working class power. Tosca himself was an independent Marxist who played a defining role in the radicalization of the Argentine workers' movement over the years that followed. He was imprisoned several times after the Cordobaso, and ultimately died while in hiding from anti-communist assassination squads. He was a local reference for the CGTA, but was far to the left of most of it. As the principal figure of the Electrical Workers Union, he worked tirelessly to promote a working class strategy to end the dictatorship. He forged close links with the student movement and united the workers' movement around not just economic demands, but a broader political aim of defeating the dictatorship. There are political criticisms to be raised of Tosco later on. But in this context, he was an emblematic figure of the working class struggle against the dictatorship. The strike which would evolve into the Cordobaso was called around two key demands. The government had moved to eliminate what was called the English Saturday, a half day worked on Saturdays, which was paid as a full day. The other issue was the so-called quitas zonales, basically salaries that were paid lower in certain regions, including Cordoba. The full day pay for Saturdays had previously compensated for this lower salary, but with its removal, workers in Cordoba were facing a dramatic attack on their salaries and working conditions. Tension had built throughout the month. May Day saw police repression of a mobilization by the CGTA, as well as separate student protests which included the use of Molotov cocktails. The conflict with the auto workers kicked off early in the month. 
a 24-hour strike on May 6 around the Quitas Zonales, followed by a 48-hour strike declared for the 15th and the 16th. The assembly to approve the strike was so packed that many were left outside the stadium, and the police unleashed repression on those outside. Transport workers organized a strike for the same day. The CGTA also declared a 24-hour strike for the 16th in solidarity. The culmination of this escalating cycle of strikes was a call for a general strike in Córdoba for May 29th and May 30th. It was called at a plenary on the 26th, which united most of the major unions, including both Tosco and Epidio Torres. The plenary almost didn't happen. Tosco was apparently convinced by a Communist Party member to join the plenary, despite his low expectations of Torres. However, a united action was agreed upon for the strike, and the march in support of it was to be the key detonator for everything that followed. Empezó con el, a discutir el tema de la autodefensa de masa, con lo cual nosotros estábamos de acuerdo de manera bastante generalizada, incluso el propio eh, Bresano, el propio Moreno, había sacado un librito sobre autodefensa de masa. Porque, digamos, la idea de la lucha armada siempre estuvo presente de veras o como tapadera en todos nosotros. Moreno cuando le decían, yo la lucha armada, pero sacaba viejos de escrito de él, yo fui de los primeros en plantear la lucha armada en la Argentina. Pero como cuando nosotros empezamos a plantear ese problema en el año 66, después en el 67 se sabe que el Che está peleando en Bolivia, Moreno arma toda una teoría de que como nosotros somos un partido internacionalista tenemos que estar por donde pasa el centro de la revolución y que si entonces el, el, el cuadro revolucionario más importante del mundo, el Che Guevara, está peleando en Bolivia nuestra obligación es mandar nuestros mejores cuadros a Bolivia ¿Qué quería el turro este? Mandarnos a Satucho y a todos nosotros pelear a Bolivia para que nos maten los Rangers y él quedarse siendo sindicalismo en la Argentina. Pero nosotros no le dimos pelota. Le dijimos, el Che plantea que la mejor manera de hacer la revolución es cada uno en su país. Así que nosotros queríamos hacer la lucha armada acá. The early 60s had seen a number of small and very unsuccessful attempts to imitate a Cuban guerrilla strategy in Argentina. In 1959, a group of 30 Peronist militants, the Uturuncos, raided a police station successfully before falling to arrests and desertions over a few months. In 1963, the EGP, a project of Che Guevara and Jorge Massetti, who is the founder of Prensa Latina, attempted to set up a FOCA with about 30 militants in the far north of Argentina. It delivered a manifesto, but got more attention from the military than the media or populace. Within a couple months, the Argentine military isolated and eliminated the EGP, and Massetti himself was disappeared. These were small, mostly ineffective efforts organized from abroad without a real foundation of support. Argentina is a country that mostly has never had a peasantry, with the countryside divided up basically from inception by large landholders and worked by agricultural laborers, a hostile environment for a traditional rural foco. However, these failed efforts would inspire later militants, many of whom radicalized in the aftermath of the 1966 military coup and when news spread of Che's death in 1967. The Communist Party of Argentina was the largest organization on the left and the first to suffer a large split under the pressure of events. The PCR, Revolutionary Communist Party, formed in 1967 out of most of the PC's youth and university organizations. 4,000 militants who were expelled for rejecting the CP's embrace of a peaceful road to power. However, the PCR was far from having a defined strategy and only held its first Congress in December 1969, months after the Corlobaso. The largest Trotskyist organization was the PRT, the Revolutionary Workers' Party, which had undergone a major split in 1968 over the question of armed struggle. Santucho and a number of key new leaders being in favor. Nahuel Moreno, the nominal leader of the organization in the lead-up to the 4th Congress in 1968, didn't even bother to show up to defend his own line. He left with his most loyal supporters and formed PRT La Verdad, rejecting any sort of armed struggle and leading the organization in a direction which trended towards a more social democratic politics. The majority followed Santucho, who had more adherents in Córdoba, Rosario, and the North, 
while Moreno retained the majority in Buenos Aires. The PRT El Combatiente, the PRT of Santucho, adopted a perspective of armed struggle, but not one which was very clearly defined. In 69, Santucho himself led a small action to rob a bank, and the organization had a significant emphasis on propaganda in favor of armed struggle. However, in the lead-up to the Corlobasso, it was still a long way from any significant independent action. Outside of the PRT, a number of smaller groups were starting to coalesce. The commandos Camilo Torres led small actions to rob police of their guns, a tiny group at the time which would later emerge as the Montaneros. Politica Obrera, workers' politics, had a more orthodox Trotskyism than the PRT and came out of the tradition of the Bolivian poor. They had a small but important presence in Córdoba, agitating for the slogan of a workers' government, one which was widely repeated in the events. Beyond this were a number of less formal circles and informal organizations. Study groups began to coalesce into embryonic organizations, whether Trotskyist, Guevarist, or different flavors of liberation theology and radicalized Peronism. Within unions, different radical tendencies began to coalesce, some of which would go on to merge organically with these organizations. None of them, however, had very significant numbers, or in the case of the largest, the PCR, they didn't have the ideological or programmatic consistency to intervene at a large scale. The most dramatic actions led by any of them were small, local actions to secure organizational resources, be that arms or money. Those with implantation in key unions were part of pressure from the base. But outside Tosco's Luz y Fuerza, no union in Córdoba was led by left-wing forces. And Tosco himself was an independent Marxist, not a member of any particular organization. However, it is very different to claim that the left was marginalized or irrelevant. Those who were organized in the left had an extremely high level of commitment and often were part of a much wider periphery of supporters. The political conditions in Argentina, a military dictatorship which had shut down the already undemocratic pseudo-elections, meant that wide layers were receptive to the message that varying extents of violence were necessary to defeat the government. What's more, the propaganda efforts of various leftist organizations justifying and calling for direct workers' actions and armed resistance certainly began to permeate throughout key sectors of the population who would take the lead in the coming uprising. Estamos aquí en La Cañada, momentos antes de que se inicie el paro decretado por la CGT. Como ustedes pueden ver, hay un vasto despliegue policial. Vemos efectivos de la Policía Federal que han llegado expresamente desde Buenos Aires para mantener el orden en esta jornada. May 29th, the day of the army. Córdoba awakens in the morning to the arrival of large detachments of police. They are well armed and with various armored support vehicles aimed at crowd control, and they begin to take up key intersections, bridges, and posts around the city center. At 11 a.m., the general strike begins. Work stops in all major factories, with a 98% absenteeism rate. Workers move out onto the streets and start to march towards the city center. Wide numbers of state and commercial employees, retail, restaurants, etc. leave work and join in the streets as well. Repression begins almost immediately, with police launching tear gas and pushing into protesters with batons and cavalry charges. In response to police repression, those in the streets take more defensive action. Construction materials and trash are tossed out into the streets and used to set aflame temporary barricades. Police advance on the protesters street by street with heavy use of tear gas, but the protesters are quickly able to pull together a few blocks back, reconstitute barricades, and put the police under pressure. Resistance to the police escalates to hurling rocks, cobblestones, and other debris. Meanwhile, a thousand protesters briefly take over and shut down the main courthouse. Workers from Renault pushed through to one of the main plazas. Two workers take head injuries from police tear gas bombs. The workers regroup together with supporters and push in through side streets, effectively flanking the police and forcing them to withdraw from the plaza. The police withdraw, but while opening fire to cover their retreat. Across the city, the police are effectively on the defensive or withdrawing outside a firm line they've maintained through a key street cutting across the city center. Nearby key skirmishes are taking place. A car is turned over and set on fire to impede the support of police cavalry. 
An attempt by firefighters supported by police to disarm a barricade is repelled by waves of protesters hurling stones. By noon, it became known that more militant sectors of the protesters, likely tied to groups in favor of armed struggle, though none claimed credit afterwards, had set themselves up as snipers around key sections of the city. It was clear even to the military as they came in later that the snipers did not actually aim to try to kill anyone or shoot anyone directly. They were effectively applying a late form of suppressing fire at intervals of 15 minutes or half an hour to keep pressure on the police or prevent them from advancing. At one in the afternoon, a number of striking workers had begun to prepare Molotov cocktails. Many, though certainly not all workers, had actually come armed to the protest with small caliber weapons or whatever they had available, but they largely did not use them up until this point. Police, however, directly opened fire on a column of workers at a major downtown intersection. Among the injured was a young auto worker, 27 years old, Maximo Mena. News of his death, and the death soon afterwards of an 18-year-old student, Daniel Castellanos, spread quickly throughout the protest. Immediately, the protesters responded. Where Mena was killed, auto workers began to return fire with their own small arms, pushing the police back. Everywhere, protesters began to push back and confront the police much more aggressively. The police, meanwhile, found themselves starting to run low on tear gas, gasoline, and even ammunition. They can't resupply since their warehouse actually falls in territory occupied by the protesters. The Third Army Corps, already mobilizing for the disturbances, declares the creation of special war councils to judge crimes against order and public safety. By 2.30, the remaining police were largely retreating and pulling back from the city itself. In the neighborhood of Clinicas, a fortress of the student movement and what will be one of the last neighborhoods to be retaken, protesters managed to detain a group of five police officers. Protesters effectively had free reign over the city at this point. Most businesses and shops were left untouched, but international American businesses were burned to the ground. In particular, a local headquarters of Xerox was the target of particular animosity among the protesters. In the absence of the police, protesters prepared the city for the arrival of the army. Barricades were thrown up, but most were supportive of a passive, defensive resistance to the impending occupation. Doing whatever could be done to slow the occupation, but no one had the expectation of actually fully resisting the intervention of the army. Neighbors would toss out old furniture or anything that could be utilized in barricades. The walls were painted with slogans aimed at the soldiers, proclaiming, Soldiers, our brothers, don't shoot, and soldiers, don't shoot against your people. At 5 p.m., the active military intervention began. Protesters communicated from rooftop to rooftop, passing word of the army's advance and of the general strategy. Do whatever we can to slow down the army, but to hold back the Molotovs and attempt to avoid any loss of life for now. The barricades fairly quickly forced the soldiers to abandon their armored vehicles in many neighborhoods and move in on foot. In some cases, the Molotov cocktails are launched just the same alongside small caliber weapon fire from the rooftops. Soldiers return fire and intense street fighting breaks out. The police headquarters faces consistent sniper fire preventing the officers from leaving the building until eventually the sniper is either captured or withdraws. By 7.30 p.m., fervor reinforcements from the National Guard come in. Soon after, the power plant workers' union, Lucy Fuerza, the same led by Tosca, shut the electricity down for all of Cordoba, producing a total blackout. Skirmishes continue throughout the city. In one neighborhood, Vija Pais, a group of protesters destroy a police station. More snipers attempt suppressing fire around the provincial capital building, but are repelled. Barricades were erected and re-erected, and shots continued to ring out throughout the night, both small and heavy caliber fire, especially in Clinicas, the student neighborhood. In the early hours of the morning, snipers launched suppressing fire against the personal homes of two ministers. Soldiers continued to advance rooftop by rooftop and forced businesses to close off access to the terraces above. At noon, the governor and minister of education give statements blaming extremist minorities and the work of urban guerrillas. Not long after, at 2.30, the key union leaders, Agustin Tosco, Elpidio Torres, and Ramon Contreras, are detained in their respective union halls. Their locals are riddled with bullet holes. 
Throughout the afternoon and into the night, soldiers continue advancing rooftop by rooftop and facing suppressing fire from snipers located in one or another hideout. A number of innocents, including a father of a 10-year-old son, were shot down without warning by soldiers. Protesters succeed in a number of rapid attacks on police stations and are pushed back and detained in others. The last holdout is in Klinikas, the student neighborhood, where the local hospital remains in control of the protesters until the evening. Lone snipers continue to harass military detachments but dwindle in numbers. By Saturday morning, the situation was largely under control, sufficiently for General Lanus to show up and deliver a press conference. By Sunday, the military had more or less complete control of the city without protests and with a strict curfew enforced. Excelentísimo señor presidente de la nación, frente a este cuadro de situación, adoptó la siguiente resolución. Designar al señor general Carcaño como comisionado federal. Con la misión de mantener el orden y la paz interna a toda costa. The exact number of dead in the aftermath of the Cordobaso is unknown. Mario Mena was the first and most famous, but the conditions of the repression meant that many more lost their lives in anonymity. Hundreds of protesters were injured. A significant number of police and military personnel were injured as well, though in classic cop style. Many of those injuries were actually the result of friendly fire. Even the snipers on the protesters' side only used their guns for suppressing fire, not real attempts to maim or kill. More than a hundred were formally arrested or detained, including both Agustin Tosco and El Pidio Torres. Among the casualties of the Cordobaso, although one which still walked and issued grandiose proclamations, was the political military regime of Argentina. The working class of Cordoba, supported by students and the majority of the broader population, successfully threw out the police, and then it took the military more than two days to properly occupy the city and restore order. This was no mere student street fighting. It was a genuine uprising and semi-insurrection which cast out all organs of state power, led by a working class which had rendered the entire city ungovernable. For the real power in Argentinian society, the wealthy elite whose interests the military dictatorship was meant to serve, this was a clear signal that they needed to go looking for new help to manage their state. The governor of Córdoba resigned soon after, and Onganía's government had its days numbered. The transformation was not immediate. Onganía lasted about a year more as head of state. He was replaced by a series of military leaders who attempted by negotiation or repression to stabilize the situation. It would take a number of more uprisings like the Cordobaso and the emergence of an ever more militant working class movement, as well as much more violent resistance to the dictatorship to force its withdrawal. And this withdrawal, in the absence of a real revolutionary overturn of capitalism, was only a temporary one before the military returned in 1976 with the bloodiest of the region's dictatorships. However, it is precisely this fact that the Corlobasso acted as the opening salvo of a significant period of working class struggle that had acquired its true significance. Those of us on the left trained in its tradition, we hear all about Paris in May of 68 which was a tremendously significant and influential event for the world left. But despite its impact, it was ephemeral. It was the peak of its own historical moment for the French working class. Argentina exists at the periphery of the capitalist system, but it's a capitalist nation. Córdoba was an industrial city defined by auto workers, students, shopkeepers, bus drivers, in summary, all the class elements of a modern industrial city with perhaps a somewhat weaker industrial bourgeoisie. Here we saw a semi-insurrection under the leadership of the working class, one which threw out the police and held back the army for two days, a confrontation which the working class walked into armed, fighting back and defending themselves with rocks, rubble, and even rifles. For those of us in the capitalist world trying to imagine what something like a modern mass urban uprising would look like, something like what a modern insurrection could or should look like, this is a powerful example. And it's an example that is only the start of a period of class struggle from 1969 to 1976, which is tremendously rich in history. 
For the nascent Argentinian left, the Corlobasa was a decisive moment and shaped their political trajectories. The militant left won control of a couple of key unions for Fiat automotive plants in Córdoba, which would go on to play a leading role in a similar uprising two years later. Within a year, the PRT El Combatiente would hold its famous Fifth Congress, where it launched the People's Revolutionary Army, ERP, to more actively lead urban guerrilla actions. The Montoneros, a left Peronist group which acquired tremendous significance in the coming period, a year later led their kidnapping and assassination of ex-president and general Aramburu, the final push that brought Onganilla to resign and for a new military leadership to take over with a different strategy. For organizations committed to an urban guerrilla strategy, it was interpreted as a signal of popular approval to take into practice what had been advanced theoretically. Others saw in the Corlobasso an insurrectional path to power. The majority of the PCR, which had been divided and unsure of how a non-Pacific strategy should unfold in Argentina, coalesced around a vision of the Corlobasso as a model for mass insurrection, which to them avoided the pacifist revisionism on the one hand and ultra-left interventionism on the other. Politica Obrera and the PRT La Verdad fit more or less uneasily into this category as well. A broad agreement on an insurrectional path did not, however, mean any very concrete agreement on how to get there. The PCR, for example, in the coming years ended almost completely tailing after Perón's regime. Corlobasso is widely remembered and hailed as the beginning of the end of the soft military dictatorship of the self-proclaimed Argentine Revolution. The historical account here in Argentina is, however, often tainted by the adaptation of much of the left under the pressure of subsequent events. The tremendous defeat of the left with the 1976 coup and subsequent executions of a generation of militants, as well as the subsequent democratization process, has left its marks. Even supposed Trotskyists utilize a discourse based on human rights. Topic for another video, but the discourse around human rights had a very clear base in anti-Soviet and anti-communist propaganda from the U.S., and it's mostly invoked today, as it always has been, to justify Western intervention. Its heavy use on the left here is a symptom of the latter's democratization and its effective pacification by the capitalist democratic state, which emerged after the dictatorship had exterminated the most militant left forces. Even today, if you see a documentary on the Corlobasso from here in Argentina, typically they will emphasize it as being simply a mass democratic protest, leaving out details which were important, like detachments of workers and students who went armed, and the snipers who harassed the occupying forces till the end. The fact is that without the armed component, the Corlobasa could not have had the same level of impact. It was in the capacity of the events to not only expel the police, but to resist the army for almost two days that it acquired its true significance and showed the incapacity of the military to effectively govern. Alongside this democratic myth, you will find a Peronist or Kirchnerist myth which places the events merely as part of the broader demands for a real democracy and the return of Perón as a potential candidate. Perón himself remarking on the events considered them to be a clear product of the left, and something quite distinct from Peronism. His sales pitch to the Argentinian bourgeoisie, one which they reluctantly accepted in 1973, was that only he and Peronism would be able to prevent these kinds of disturbances and secure social peace and stability. The Corlobasso could be what it was in many ways precisely because in Corloba, Peronism was not as strong as it was in the capital or many other regions of Argentina. The Corlobasso was something more than a general strike, but less than a full insurrection. An uprising which took and briefly held an entire city under the clear leadership of the working class. It was not and did not pretend to be a new Paris commune. The repression, also while important, certainly didn't approach the level that anything like a failed insurrection would face. Leaders were arrested, not executed. This was possible also because it marked the beginning, not the end or the culmination of a revolutionary opportunity for Argentina's working class. A Corlobasa was possible in 1969, but would not have been in 1976, when the polarization of the historical period brought on by the Corlobasa raised class conflict to a higher level and pose more bluntly the question of revolution or counter-revolution. There is an account among certain Trotskyist sectors 
where the Corlobasa was the lost Fred that the left should have followed rather than pursuing guerrilla adventures. I want to agree with this mostly, but only to an extent, in that within the Corlobasa, as it really happened, armed workers and snipers, applying suppressing fire included, this was the kind of class independent path pushing towards power that it was the left's task to deepen, build upon, and lead to power. But the tasks which lay before the Argentine working class in the late 70s were different. Already in 1971, there had been a second Corlovaso, the Vivorazo, this time one more openly directed by the left, with leftist controlled unions and in which even the armed detachments of the left started to play a vital role. As the crisis and conflict deepened, a show of force and of discontent was not enough. A road to power was needed. October 1917, in Russia after all, was not a repeat of February 1917, and was even further from the exact dynamics of the 1905 revolution. Unfortunately, all the currents of the left in Argentina proved ultimately incapable of resolving this problem. For a variety of reasons, which it's beyond the scope of this video in particular to dive into. What I want to rescue from the Corlobasso, first and foremost, is its importance to our tradition, the international working class tradition, and the tradition of revolutionary Marxism. This is something which should be held up and recognized as one of the most monumental events of the 1960s for our class. It's an event that is not alien to our own political and economic moment. This was not a far-flung peasant revolution or an anti-colonial independence struggle. This was a working-class uprising in the shadow of a stagnating capitalist society. As a working-class uprising, it may seem obvious, but it is central to point out the importance of the working class in this. A working class which, despite a Peronist leadership of one of its most significant unions, was able to force its leadership into a united general strike that went far beyond the limits imposed by Peronism. To really speak of a united front without a revolutionary party putting that tactic to work is a bit of an anachronism. But if Tosco hadn't been willing to negotiate a united action with the Peronist leadership of the auto workers, the Corlobasa wouldn't have happened. The action itself went far beyond the bounds of where Peronism would have led it. As Trotsky once declared in a very different context, election agreements, parliamentary compromises conclude between the revolutionary party and the social democracy serve, as a rule, to the advantage of the social democracy. Practical agreements for mass action for purposes of struggle are always useful to the revolutionary party. We can also see in this uprising the importance that the left plays even when it's in an embryonic propagandist stage. The organized left was not much larger or more significant than it is in many countries today. It was highly motivated and, and highly committed, inspired by historic world events. But numerically, it wouldn't have turned any heads compared to the left in many countries today. Despite this, leftists in the unions, including Tosco as an independent leftist leader of one of the most militant ones, leftists in student unions, and the broader propaganda work of the left laid the ideological and organizational foundations necessary for something like the Corlobasso to happen. The left can punch far above its weight in the right conditions and with the right ideas, and it's something important for us to remember today, even as the left remains small and as we seem very distant from these kind of dramatic uprisings. The whole historical period it ushered in from 1969 to the bloody junta dictatorship of 76 onwards deserves to be deeply studied. The Corlobasa was not a flash in a pan. It was the opening move of a long game that ultimately resulted in our defeat. But this defeat was not a foregone conclusion, and the revolutionaries who lived through this period, the debates which raged among the left, the successes and miscalculations, all were the kind of challenges faced by Marxists navigating the project of working class power in the context of an industrial society, with the challenges of bourgeois democracy, bourgeois nationalism, military autocracy, and more. While conditioned by certain national peculiarities and the different conditions of South America, this is the closest living material for those of us wishing to study and apply revolutionary politics under the kind of conditions faced in most of Europe and the Americas today. For those who walked the streets in May of 69 in Córdoba, who saw the police flee before the working class, and saw the military struggle to regain control, anything seemed possible. A workers' government and workers' power felt distant but within reach. 
Those of us still fighting for the same thing owe it to ourselves and to them to remember their struggle, learn from it, and apply those lessons as best we can to our work today. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to see future videos and check the description for my sources and also where you can find me on Evermedia.